Well, good afternoon uh, and good evening, everyone, depending on where in the country you are. Uh, we want to welcome you to tonight's webinar on Zephyr valves, a minimally invasive treatment option uh, for the treatment of patients with severe emphysema. My name is Jim Outlaw. I work for Pulmonics Corporation, the company who makes and distributes the Zephyr valve. Uh, and it has been my pleasure over the last three and a half years to work with the interventional pulmonology team at Henry Ford Hospital here in Detroit, Michigan. Over the last three and a half years, they have built really one a gold standard Zephyr valve program uh, and one of the largest programs, not only in the country, but in the entire world. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, several key members of that team, uh, starting with Dr. Avi Cohen, who's an interventional pulmonologist and the lead physician for the Zephyr valve program at Henry Ford Health System. Also, Rebecca Preeb, nurse practitioner, who is the lead nurse practitioner and lung navigator for the Henry Ford Interventional Pulmonology Team and a critical piece to the program there at Henry Ford. And also Jill Bunn, who is the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction nurse coordinator uh, for the program and another key component to that team. Uh, so with that being said, it is my pleasure to uh, turn it over to Dr. Cohen. I do wanna just uh, first one housekeeping item. Uh, if you do have any questions, you will notice in the, uh, the bottom bar, there is a Q&A and also a chat link. If you could please utilize the Q&A, if at all possible, we will do, do our best to uh, get all those questions answered uh, as the program goes on tonight. So thank you very much for being here. And Dr. Cohen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It is a pleasure to, to reach out to everyone and let you know about this great, great type of procedure that can help as many people as we can get to. And without further ado, we'll start our presentation. So we're going to start um, talking about what emphysema and COPD is to begin with. And once we do that, we'll talk about what the treatments are for people who have really severe emphysema. And within those treatments, we'll talk a lot about bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Once we get a sense of what bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, we'll tell you how our patients have done in the past, how, how the results, uh, how the outcomes are, and what you can do to find out if you're a good candidate and how to go about figuring that out and getting yourself plugged in to get worked up. So we'll start with uh, emphysema. Now, emphysema and COPD, <clears throat> They're both chronic diseases that occur with a lot of smoking. As you smoke, there are these elastic bands around your lung. The lung is like a balloon. And when you take a deep breath in, when you let go of the balloon, the air comes out. So the elastic band around the lungs pushes all of that air out of your lungs. In COPD with smoking and emphysema, especially emphysema, a lot of that elastic band gets worn down. It gets damaged, permanently damaged. I don't know if you guys have ever had an old sock and when you pull it open to put it on, you realize that the elastic band of it is gone. That's kind of what your emphysema and this lungs are like. And so you're, when you take a deep breath in and you relax to let the air out, the air doesn't get out very effectively. That's the obstruction part of COPD. So as, as that time goes on, when you take a deep breath in, as you can see on this picture on the left, on the right side, the lungs get really big and they push down on the muscles that help you breathe. One of those muscles is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is like a plunger that sucks the air in and then lets it go. The diaphragm is very important for you to be able to breathe comfortably. And when you take a deep breath in and it ends up getting trapped inside of the lung. It can't come out very well. That leads to call to what's called hyperinflation. Hyper meaning a lot, inflation meaning inflated and large volume air staying inside. So hyperinflation, that pressure on the diaphragm is what really drives the, the symptoms of emphysema and COPD, the symptoms of feeling short of breath. Those symptoms really cause a big decline in your in your, in your quality of life. Patients who have more hyperinflated lung, as you can see on this graph on the left, overall, they tend to feel short of breath with the simplest thing they do. They could sit around and watch TV, but they're, they're shoveling the snow or they're going for a bike ride and 
something as simple as even putting on their clothes or trying to do the dishes really gets them out of breath because that diaphragm is just being pushed down and it doesn't have room to move. A lot of these patients end up needing more oxygen. They, they are working, their muscles are working overtime to make up for what their lungs can't do. And so they start losing a lot of weight. They get muscle wasting. Um, that hyperinflation puts pressure not only on the diaphragm and the lungs, but also on the heart, and it can cause low cardiac output. And so when you have hyperinflation, when you have shortness of breath, you can't really be very active. When you can't be very active because anything you do causes more and more breathlessness, you sit around, you end up becoming more out of shape. You, you keep getting more out of shape. You can't do things that you used to do three, four months ago or a year ago, and you further decondition, you further get more out of shape. You get to the point where you're so out of shape that if you're not doing anything, um, you start wasting away and you're at very high risk of, of dying of mortality. And that's, that's, that's the big cycle of COPD and emphysema that starts with just not being able to do basic things. So, so what do we do? What can we do to help you get that air out? What can we do to help you reduce the risks of your lungs continuously getting worse? Main thing is to quit smoking. Um, beyond that, I'm sure a lot of you are, are receiving perhaps oxygen therapy, steroids, or inhalers. Those, those directly help the lungs, those, those elastic parts, the parts of the lung that let the air out to open up and let the air out effectively. Next, you might have done pulmonary rehabilitation. Pulmonary rehabilitation focuses on getting those muscles a lot stronger to make up for what the lungs couldn't do before. Um, in some cases, there are invasive ways to help you. One is called lung volume reduction surgery. It's a big surgery that cuts piece of the lung out to allow room for, for the diaphragm to move for to make up for that extra space that air is getting trapped into. And then beyond that, if the lungs are bad enough, lung transplantation, which, which uh, essentially is the last potential uh, for patient. So we have non-invasive ways and we have invasive ways to try to help you with COPD. Recently, uh, in 2009, the FDA approved a new approach, and, and that's um, endobronchial valves, which is minimally invasive. Zephyrs, uh, the company by Pulmonics that creates these valves, um, is, is, has been at the forefront of, of endobronchial valve placement and, and bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. These tiny little valves have been FDA approved for severe emphysema patients. They're tiny, they're implantable, implantable. They're, they're similar to the results that we're seeing with them are similar to surgeries where we take out a piece of the lung. But the benefits are, are good in a sense that it's fully removable. If, if anything goes wrong or if there's any complications or risks associated with it, it could easily be re reversed. Um, now with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Rebecca Preeb, our bronchoscopic, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction at Henry Ford Nurse Practitioner. And she's gonna to talk to you more about the procedure. Thanks, Avi. Um, so <clears throat> the procedure itself, again, is minimally invasive. Um, the whole entire procedure is done through this tiny scope that you see on the screen. It's called the bronchoscope. And what we do essentially is take our tools and stuff, put it through the scope, and it pops out the end of the scope that has a tiny camera on it. And everything is done, again, and uh, endoscopically through the scope. The procedure itself takes about 45 to 60 minutes you get put to sleep with medicine. Most institutions um, currently are using what we call general anesthesia, where patients are put to sleep, um, put, on a uh, put a breathing tube through their mouth, and then again, the whole procedure is done through them. Some institutions are doing it um, with moderate or deep sedation where uh, they go through the nose or the mouth um, and not a tube, but it all varies. So you'd have to reach out to the institution that's closest to you to to, um, to discuss that with them. The best part about it is, again, there's no cutting. So it's a same day surgery. Um, you are admitted afterwards, but there's no sutures that you have to be removed. Um, and it's, it's essentially pain-free as there's no pain fibers within the, the inside of the lung.
and this is a video on how it works. Heal Valve is a proven, minimally invasive treatment designed to improve breathing, activity, and quality of life for emphysema patients who are breathless despite maximum medical therapy. <coughs> the Zephyr Valve procedure is performed under general anesthesia or conscious sedation where a standard bronchoscope and flexible delivery catheter are used to guide the valves into the target lobe and desired airway. Multiple valves are implanted to ensure complete occlusion of all airways leading to the target lobe of the lung. Valves may be placed at the lobar, segmental or subsegmental levels dependent on the airway anatomy. Trapped air in the treated lobe escapes through the Zephyr valves until the lung volume of the treated lobe is reduced. The valves can be removed and replaced if needed. After treatment, the remaining lobes can expand more fully and pressure on the diaphragm is relieved, improving breathing mechanics and overall lung function. Patients who respond to Zephyr valve treatment often experience meaningful improvement within 45 days. The Zephyr endo. Great. After the procedure, you, um, the uh, FDA here in the United States is recommending a three to five day hospitalization. The one question I get a lot from patients is not only about the hospitalization, but how many valves do I get? And it varies between individuals. Um, and it's all based on the size of your airways from the inside. And, and no provider knows how many valves you are going to get. Uh, the day of the procedure. It can be anywhere from one to, um, we've put as much as eight valves in a patient. And it doesn't mean that more is more successful or less is more successful. It's just, you know, what fits for you as an individual. So yes, after the procedure, you're admitted for three to five days and it's really for monitoring of any symptoms or side effects. And here's the risks of the procedure. And these risks and the uh, percentages associated with these risks are all based off the Liberate trial, which was the main trial that was done here in the United States and international to get the procedure essentially approved here um, to offer to individuals in the United States. The biggest risk is pneumothorax or lung collapse on the side that, that we place the valves. And the reason for that is it's not essentially a complication, but it's uh, the nature of the procedure as we put valves in one part of the lung and that lung starts to get smaller and smaller, the other lobes have to expand to fill its space. And sometimes if it expands too quickly, um, then a pneumothorax can occur or collapse of that lung. And a chest tube needs to be placed in order for that lung to reinflate. That just would prolong your hospital stay. And that's okay. Once that tube comes out, then you would go home. The pneumothorax rate can be up to 20 to 25%. So one in five individuals who come for procedure may experience a pneumothorax. That's the highest risk. Other potential um, risks include an exacerbation of your COPD, which includes uh, wheezing or coughing that you would need steroids for, pneumonia, less than 1% of uh, this population, where you would need antibiotics or potentially maybe valve removal. Uh, death is less than 3% within the study or worsening breathing where some patients may need a little bit more oxygen for the first 45 days or so. After the procedure and you're discharged home, there, there is, um, uh, most institutions would like you to follow up for testing. At, at Henry Ford, we do a visit at 45 days um, six months and 12 months, and we do additional testing to make sure the valves are working for you, they're working properly, and if they're not um, and need to be replaced, then we would, we would talk about that. That is a very uh, rare occasion. You would continue to follow with your primary pulmonologist and the, uh, in addition to following up with whoever placed your valves, you would continue all the COPD medications, the valves, are essentially like adding in another inhaler to your regimen, um, just an additional therapy. And then we would encourage you to go back to pulmonary rehab. We have found at our institution that those patients who are active and in pulmonary rehab are doing a lot better. 
So what are the results of BLVR? Because I'm looking at some of the questions that are being posed and a lot of people want to know, you know, what's the success rate and, and, and is it going to be good for me? We really need to go back to the goal of the procedure and that's to improve your shortness of breath. This procedure is, and that's what it does. It decreases gas trapping so that muscle that helps you breathe, the diaphragm, can move better. And when it can move better, you become less short of breath. You're able to walk further and do more and be less short of breath. When you get short of breath, you can re recover a lot faster. And overall, a lot of our patients say they have an improved quality of life. This is not a cure for your emphysema or your COPD. It's an approach at improving the symptoms that your emphysema is causing, like this breathlessness. And it doesn't guarantee that you'll get off oxygen. Have we had patients get off oxygen? Of course, but it's not the normal. And so that shouldn't be an expectation of the valves. When we uh, have looked and talked to uh, some of our patients, you can go to the next slide. When we've talked to some of our patients, these are the, the benefits that they've reported, that they're less short of breath, that they can do activities like bathing and grocery shopping or tending to their garden or going for walks with their spouse. Um, they have fewer limitations in their ability to do you know, uh, activities. Some of our patients who you know, are still young in their 50s are returning back to work. They have more energy. They feel less tightness around their chest. Um, some of our patients have had reflux type symptoms um, that have gone away after the valves. And then they're more confident leaving their home because they don't, um, you know, they don't have to stop 12 times to go into the grocery store. And so those are just some of the patient reported benefits. Uh, when you talk to one of our patients, he will give you his story as well and, and his benefits that he's, um, that he's had uh, with his procedure. To give you the clinical um, findings of that question, you know, what is the success rate? There has been multiple clinical trials and studies that are looking at, you know, is this procedure successful for patients? And I've listed, and here's, there's four that are listed for you. And what I'd like to kind of, you know, look at the table, because I know it's a lot in, of numbers and, and tables, but the um, procedure success rate is in the, you know, in the uh, close to the 90% range. And when we're looking at improvement of lung function, um, which is the uh, middle column where it says FEV1, that's really the percentage of how well a person breathes. And it's a number between zero and 100%. And people with severe COPD or emphysema are typically under 40%. And so, the lung function improvement that these patients are getting are anywhere from 16 to 30 percent improvement on top of you know their 40 percent which can be life-changing for people their exercise capacity they are able to walk 39 more meters than they were prior to the valves and that doesn't seem like a lot but it is pretty significant when someone can't even walk a foot and now they're able to walk you know the are three meters and now they're able to walk these almost 40 to 100 meters and then their quality of life is significantly improved and so that's what these studies are are telling us now i'm going to turn you over to jill bunn she is our um a blvr coordinator extraordinaire as like i to call her and she's really the hub of um our program at Henry Ford. And um, she's going to talk about how to find out if you're a good candidate for this procedure that can help. Hello. Um, so we start off with just making sure that you have a confirmed diagnosis of emphysema. Are you trapping gas in your lungs? Is Are you short of breath? Are you not smoking? Um, there needs to be certain numbers that you meet on your pulmonary function testing, your breathing tests that show us that you're trapping enough gas that you would really benefit from these valves. And if you do really trap enough gas, then you are a good candidate. There's other testing, of course, too. Um, 
you have to be on the optimal medical management for your COPD, which means you're on the right inhalers, you're on maximum therapy, um, you're using them correctly. Um, there's no evidence of the collateral ventilation on your um, CAT scan that we do when you come in for your consultation. And you don't have any absolute contraindications to having the procedure. Um, and that is all dependent on which uh, facility you go to. So this is a, um, a de description of collateral ventilation. And um, we're going to go through a video, and then we will talk about it a little bit more after. Um, it's Here's the video, and then we'll simplify it the a Zephyr little bit. Zephyr valve is the first endobronchial valve to receive approval from the FDA for patients with either heterogeneous and homogeneous emphysema with little to no collateral ventilation. Determining collateral ventilation status is a key step in determining candidacy for Zephyr valves because the valves will only benefit target lobes without collateral ventilation. But before we talk about what collateral ventilation is, let's start with basic anatomy. Your lungs are made up of five lobes. The right lung is composed of three lobes, the upper lobe, the middle lobe, and the lower lobe. These lobes are separated by two fissures, which keep the lobes from communicating with each other. The left lung is composed of only two lobes, the upper and lower lobes, and is separated by only one fissure. Fissures serve as a physical boundary containing air within each lobe. Sometimes these boundaries are not complete, allowing air to pass freely between lobes. This is called collateral ventilation. It is important to identify whether the target lobe has collateral ventilation because Zephyr valves will only work if collateral ventilation is not present. Zephyr valves are placed in a lobe which has collateral ventilation. The lobe will continue to refill through collateral airways, not allowing the lobe to deflate. Therefore, patients with collateral ventilation are unlikely to benefit from Zephyr valves. When there is no collateral ventilation present in the target lobe, Zephyr valves are placed in all airways leading to the most diseased lobe of the lung. The one-way valves function by preventing air from entering the lobe on inhalation and allow air to escape on exhalation. This allows the lobe to deflate, reducing the volume in the treated lobe, which is only accomplished if there is no collateral ventilation reinflating the treated lobe. Okay, so collateral ventilation, a good way to think about it is um, those fissures are like walls between the different lobes of your lungs. So those walls need to be solid because when we put in the valves, the valves are one-way valves that are letting the air out of that hyperinflated lung. So as the air goes out, you know, um, we're not letting any more air back in. So we're shutting the front door basically of the lobe. And if there's holes in that fissure, in that fissure line or in those walls, it's like the windows are open and air is still gonna be coming back into that lobe. So that lobe will never deflate and um, you would not benefit from the valves. So hopefully that simplifies that explanation a little bit for you. Um, so the clinical screening, um, the pre-testing to see if you're going to benefit from the valves is you have to have um, certain numbers on your breathing tests. So the, the main numbers we look at are the FBV1, and that is like your general lung function. Um, the residual volume, that is when you take in a breath, um, the air gets, goes down into your lungs. And when you exhale, the residual volume is how much, it's a measurement of how much is left in your lungs after you exhale. And then the total lung capacity, that is just how much air your lungs hold. Um, so specific numbers need to be met in order to um, really be able to benefit from the valves. Um, we're going to see a, a definitive diagnosis of emphysema based off of your pulmonary function testing and your CAT scan, because you can see emphysema on the CAT scan. And then there's um, a couple other tests that we do as like a six minute walk to make sure you can, you're not too debilitated to be able to undergo surgery. So um, you have to be able to walk 100 meters or 328 feet in the six minutes. 
Um, and then we also do an echocardiogram just to make sure that your heart is functioning okay and that that is not the reason for your shortness of breath because certain heart conditions can cause that shortness of breath symptom. Um, so when you come for your consultation, we do a CAT scan. Um, we don't know on the day of your consultation if you're a good candidate or not, because we take that CAT scan and we put it into this special, um, we get this special report. It's called the Stratix report. And there's a picture of that on your screen. If you look at that Stratix report, you're going to see the lighter and darker colors. The darker the color, the more damage to the emphysema. Um, it also shows us um, your Fisher integrity score, which is how well those walls are solid. And those uh, walls need to be solid and have a score of 80% or higher for us to um, go ahead and try putting the valves in because anything less than 80%, the valves are just not going to work. Um, when once we look at the Stratix report and we decide that you're a good candidate, then um, you know we take you to the operating room. Um, in that operating room, we're going to do what's called the Chartist test. Um, it, what happens is they put this balloon in your airways and they blow out the balloon and they suck the air out. And what happens is that simulates the valves. That is going to tell us um, if there's like little holes in your fissures that we weren't able to see on the CAT scan. And that is the final test um, that's not done until you're in the operating room, unfortunately, um, to tell us if the valves are going to work for you. If you're CV negative, um, collateral ventilation negative, and your walls are solid, then we place valves. If unfortunately it happens in a handful of patients, there are those little holes in the walls, then you don't get valves and you go home that day. Um, the Zephyr valve is an accepted treatment globally by um, you know, many global societies that are uh, have you know, endorsed the, the Zephyr valve as a good treatment for people with COPD. Once we uh, know that you're a good candidate based off of the Stratix report for um, the valves, then we go ahead and we do, um, we have to acquire insurance authorization before we bring you to the operating room. Most insurances do cover it. Medicare A and B does cover it at the 80%, um, like they do all the, most other things. But um, it's a case by case basis. We never know until we submit it to your insurance company if they're going to cover it fully. Um, Pulmonix does have a full reimbursement um, helping people. Uh, reimbursement, I can't think of a better word right now, but uh, <laughs> support program, <laughs> thank you, um, that uh, helps us get and acquire authorization before we bring you to the operating room. So you don't get any surprise bills in the mail. And to look for a treating center near you, um, just go to this website, uspatients.pulmonics.com, and um, you can find a, a treating center in your area. Thank you very much. And it's with my pleasure that I get to introduce one of our treated patients, um, Guy Laporte. He is a young man who was a former smoker. Um, when I met him in 2019, um, he was wearing two liters of oxygen um, around the clock uh, to, to ambulate and, and exercise. Um, he has stage four emphysema when and his lung function was at 39%. Um, and he was able to walk 190 meters when I saw him. He was evaluated in clinic. His um, CT was uploaded into that Stratix program that Jill uh, talked about briefly. And he was a candidate for the valves to the right upper lobe. He received four valves to the right upper lobe on July 10th of 2019. 
Um, he had no complications uh, intra or postoperatively and was discharged after the uh, five day hospital stay. Um, when he returned back to us um, for his 45, six month and one year or did his testing uh, locally uh, and virtually saw us, um, he was, he's been doing great and his lung numbers had improved from 39% to 78% at his one year visit and he was able to walk uh, almost 500 meters from his 190 meters. So Guy. How are you? <laughs> oh, I am uh, better than I, I deserve to be, uh, considering the uh, the way I treated my lungs over the years. Not only was I life, a lifelong smoker, but I grew up in a coal heated house, uh, two blocks away from the tracks where they brought the coal into town. So um, a very very dirty environment coming up, um, and then. Uh, um, in the military and post-military, I had asbestos uh, exposure, so um, I, I was feeling pretty down. Like she it's said, I was down to 30, 39%, and I could uh, barely walk to my mailbox and back, and uh, I would, and my, my lips would be blue. And uh, today I have absolutely no restrictions on myself. I can, if I want to go walk for a mile, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And tell us, Guy, when you were in the hospital, tell me how your procedure went and your hospital stay. Well, I just went to sleep and then it was just a, a nap and coming to, um, uh, I, I like to say what it felt like was that the, uh, an anaconda that had been constricting my lungs for forever had just uh, slithered away. Um, I instantly had a, a deeper breath. And when I started talking to my wife, she said, Guy, I can hear your words. And my voice had gotten so weak over the years that uh, my, I could barely get the stuff out. Um, I could not be happier with the procedure. I had no complications either in the hospital or after. Uh, these things are, are uh, real Cadillacs. Six months after I got them, I fell on the ice and broke a three ribs right underneath those valves. Mm -hmm. I punctured the lungs. I got a pneumothorax. Uh, and uh, I got that healed up and I'm still at the same volume of, of lungs, so. That's wonderful. And tell me how you think your life has changed. What are you able to do now that you couldn't do before the valves? Well, um, gardening is, is in there. Um, I have some back issues that prevent me from doing a lot of the things I'd like to do but I have the ability to ambulate. I can go anywhere I want and do anything I want. Um, you know, not, not like a 30 year old kid, but for a 65 year old guy, I'm moving pretty well. We're That's pretty wonderful. happy with it. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. I think we have a bunch of questions from the group so we can get to those, Dr. Cohen. All right, thank you everybody, Guy. It was a pleasure taking care of you and I hope we don't have to see you again because you're doing so well. Um, but I do, I do, I am glad that you're doing so well. Uh, now with that, we're gonna open up the floor to some questions. There have been some questions I've asked and I, and I ask of you, if you do have questions, there are two buttons at the bottom of your screen, one called Q&A and the other called chat. Please post your questions into the Q&A and as we go along, we'll post them. And then I will look through the chat and see if anything was left over is how long are the valves good for? Well, we've had, we've been starting, we started doing this procedure since 2019. And we've had patients that are out there with these valves since then, and they're doing very well. So the valves are designed in a way to last as long as they can over several years in time. Um, having said that, there's another question that came up. Is there a risk for these valves to, to migrate? And, and yes, there is. It's a very low risk. Um, Rebecca, do you happen to have that number at Henry Ford? Uh, for 
for valve migration. Correct. Or revision rate, I should say. A revision rate. Yes, we've had 14% uh, percent of our patients had a leaky valve that needed to be revised. Yeah, so out of 150 patients, there's maybe a 10 of you guys who may, 10, 15 of you guys that may need to have a revision. And revisions are done very simply, the same way that the valves are done. You come into the hospital, we take out the old ones that look like they dislodged, and we put in new ones with a different size if necessary. Um, let's see what other questions I have. There are a lot of questions about smoking. How long do you have to stop smoking before you're eligible for this um, procedure? Jill, do you want to take that one? Yes, we would like you to be um, smoke free for a minimum of four months before we um, proceed with the evaluation. Now that includes, um, you know, vaping and also marijuana. So um, once you are smoke free for four months, then we can move forward with evaluation. Uh, thank you for that. And the, and the main reason is because the smoking itself could lead to high risk of pneumonia and having these valves in while you're smoking puts you at very high risk of developing pneumonia. And the last thing we want to do is cause more harm than good. So that's why we want you to show that you can quit smoking for at least four months before proceeding to it. Um, I got a question saying, what is, how difficult are the valves to be removed? What is the rejection rate? I, I believe we kind of answered that. It's about 10 to 14% chance, at least at Henry Ford for the valves to, what we mean by rejection is they migrate a little or they're leaky around they them. Leak, you know? How difficult are they to be removed? They're very easy. They're designed in a way that we can simply go in and pluck them out within 15 minutes and mm -hmm. replace them if we need to, or leave them out if you're not seeing any any uh, improvement there's a question that's asked yes yeah i was like there's questions about um uh is there is there lifelong restrictions after getting the valves and that is essentially no i mean it is an a, essentially a, an addition to the therapy that you're already on yes you can fly you can even have an mri if you hurt your shoulder or something and needed to get an mri they're all compatible um uh and you don't have there's no restrictions uh, post, post valve placement. Yeah, so I see a lot of questions about um, turn down. Why are people being turned down um, for certain reasons? Um, a common one is you may be too healthy to need these valves. You know, these valves do come with risks, although they're very low. Um, and they do come with benefits. We like to take small risks for big rewards. So if we think that your lungs are healthy enough that we don't think these valves are going to help you, they're going to benefit you, then you may not be a candidate. You may hear from your doctors to saying that your lungs are too healthy for this. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get the valves maybe in two, three, four, five years, you should come back and have breathing tests done because your lungs can continue to decline as you get older. And at some point, you may reach that area where it will benefit you and the risks are low enough that we're willing to take in and put you through this. Um, what if your pulmonologist has advised you not to have general anesthesia? I've been told I'd never make it off the vent. That, that's, it's a very, that's a very good question. We hear that very commonly. Yeah, we do. You and everybody else on the call. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, yes, a lot of patients who need to go undergo this valve have very sick lungs, extremely sick lungs. And of the 150 people we've done, we haven't, anyone, haven't had anyone that ended up staying on the ventilator or not being able to get off the ventilator. If you're too sick to take that mini marathon, we, won't, we will tell you, we'll be honest with you and tell you, we don't think it's safe to do this. But like I said, of all 150 people, all of you guys, all 150 people that we've done, we're really sick. And, and a lot of people may not have the experience and say that you may never come off the ventilator. But I do advise you to see someone who does these valves um, to determine whether you are too sick to have the procedure or you're healthy enough to have the procedure. Um, I get a lot of questions about carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels. Um, one thing to note is if you're not on oxygen, that doesn't mean you're not a candidate because feeling short of breath is more than just 
being able to get oxygen into your blood through your lungs. With this type of procedure, it's more about the lungs being too full of air that they can't get out, putting pressure on your breathing muscles. So a lot of our patients are not on oxygen when they undergo this procedure. Um, will they be on oxygen afterwards? Very rarely. Very rarely do people end up needing oxygen after the procedure. In fact, in some cases, people even get off oxygen after the procedure. Um, there's a few questions about infections. Some people are saying they have had infections like um, MAC or bronchiectasis, for example. We do tend not to place valves on patients who have active infections that have not been treated. The reason is these are one-way valves. They're blocking air from coming out. They could also block secretions or things like that from coming out. And if we put a valve in a place that might have a festering infection without treating the infection first, that infection could get worse and worse and worse. So I do advise you to talk to your local pulmonologist and at least get any infections that are going on for a while treated before considering putting, putting in the valves. Uh, I got a question asking if you can smoke after pr the procedure. <laughs> the, the answer, the simple answer is yes, no. you could, but we don't advise it. We do not advise it. We can't force you to do anything, but it, we highly advise against smoking. The reason is these valves are tiny little foreign bodies in your lungs. And throughout, after you get these valves, you do have a tiny risk of developing pneumonias, easy pneumonias that are treated with easy antibiotics. But if you're smoking, that risk goes up a lot. And every time you have pneumonia or a flare with COPD, your lung function will drop a little bit, a little bit, and a little bit at a time. So if you're still smoking, you're doing yourself a disservice um, and you're taking away what this valve is meant to do, help you breathe more easily. Any other questions that you guys were reading that came to mind? Um, uh, I get a lot of questions about age limitation and ranges for lung function and that kind of thing. Every institution varies. The clinical trials and the studies looked at ages of patients under 75 years of age. At Henry Ford, you know, we don't discriminate on age and we've, we've valved patients in their 80s. And so, it really does vary between institutions and programs and, and people doing the procedure. So what may you know, exclude you from one program may not for a different program. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot of questions for is you know, if my lung functions 52%, is that too good? We know that your lung function over when you're reached 40 and above declines every year, whether you're smoking or not. It's just when you were smoking, it was declining much faster. And so you may not be a candidate today, but six months from now, if you become more short of breath, you, you know, you may be a candidate then. So I would encourage you to still kind of reach out and get testing um, because you may not be a candidate today, but maybe next year. There's a good question I'm reading. Um, why does it take 45 days to determine whether you have received any benefit from the procedure? Rebecca, would you like to take that one? Of course, that is a great question. So <clears throat> what we're looking at for the valves is again, it's a one-way valve. And so as you take a breath in, you know, you typically trap gas. Well, now that you have the valve and the, uh, when you take a breath in, the valve closes. So you can't trap any additional gas. But then when you breathe out that gas gets exhaled out and that partial port of the lung that we put these valves in starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. We like that to happen over a period of time because if it happens within you know, a slower period of time, there's less chances of a patient getting that lung collapse that we talked about earlier. Some patients, it happens the day of the procedure and that's fine. Um, but at the 45 day mark, when we bring patients back to clinic, we can you know, really get a sense at quantifying with their breathing tests. If their gas trapping is less, we do imaging studies to see you know, if that valve is working appropriately and that lung's getting, and getting smaller. So we do like it to be over a gradual period of time. And for probably about 80% of our patients, um, that's, that occurs that way. 
Guy, do you have anything to add that you'd like to? Yes, uh, along with this wonderful procedure, uh, I think a lot of my recovery has been um, mindful breathing skills. I just picked them up off of YouTube and they are very helpful. Breathing properly. And, and Guy, Guy makes a great point. It's, it's always important to realize that this isn't a replacement treatment. This is this is an additive. It's an it's an additional treatment to everything you should be doing, and everything you should be doing includes the pulmonary rehabilitation, the inhalers. Make sure you don't continue smoking, and, and as Guy mentioned, those breathing techniques that he learned to help him through COPD. So this is this is this is one extra thing to add, not anything to replace. Now, having said that, I'm going to answer a few questions about oxygen and inhalers. Uh, and to repeat, some people get off oxygen, some people get on oxygen. It's very few people that get on oxygen or get off oxygen. Most people stay the same way they were. Um, there's questions about inhalers. Um, some people can come off inhalers. Again, it's very rare to do in that situation, most people will end up on the same type of inhalers because we're not treating the COPD. The inhaler is treating the COPD. We're inhaling the, in, the hyperinflation, the, the large volume of air that's stuck in your lungs. So the inhalers are doing something different and the valves are doing something different. Um, there are questions about if you've had surgeries on your lungs. This is on a case-by-case -case basis. If you've had part of your lung taken out because of surgery or, 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 or cancers or anything of that sort, I do recommend you get in touch with your local pulmonologist and, and see if they, would be consider, they would consider you for valve placement. There are questions about who does these procedures. At minimum, it's a pulmonologist. A pulmonologist is a specialist who has trained in, in working the bronchoscope. That's that camera that we use to go through your mouth and put the valves in your lungs. Um, other than pulmonologists, some, some thoracic surgeons may do it. I'm not familiar with any. Um, interventional pulmonologists are pulmonologists that have done extra training to do these kind of procedures and, and beyond. So interventional pulmonologists usually have the most amount of experience. So if you've seen a general pulmonologist who suggested that you may not be a candidate or you're too sick for the procedure, it may be of benefit to seek out a second opinion with an interventional pulmonologist who may be able to, to have a, a greater skill set or experience in terms of placing these valves. Um, there are questions about numbers. You know, my numbers are this, my numbers are that. Um, and, and again, the numbers are important. The numbers in your breathing test tell us if there's gas getting trapped in your lungs. The numbers in your breathing test tell us if your COPD or emphysema is bad enough to have this test done. Um, so that's a very important thing to follow up on. We wouldn't want to take anybody we don't think is going to do well with the procedure or not even benefit from the procedure. So, so we're going to be honest with you and tell you that your numbers are good. It's, it's the valves are may not or may work for you. But again, it's important to follow up, have these testing done at least once a year and see if anything changes from year to year. Because some people whose numbers are too good this year may be worse next year, and they may benefit from the valves at that point. Let's see if I have any other question. So we answered that one. Dr. Cohen, I think a, a good question might be for Jill. A lot of times we get questions regarding um, insurance coverage and prior authorization. Maybe you could briefly speak to that process for uh, for the patients that come through. So everything is a case by case basis. Um, each insurance company is different. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is much different than Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. And each of them have their own coverages um, and own policies written um, pertaining to this uh, procedures. I did see one about um, people smoking marijuana and uh, why they're not candidates, it's because we, we don't want you smoking at all. 
anything yeah, um, that any continues. Yeah, it's it's smoking. So um, if you want to use any kind of marijuana products, you can definitely eat them, and that doesn't continue to damage your lungs. Um, but any kind of inhaled product, um, vaping, smoking cigarettes, smoking marijuana is going to continue to damage your lungs and increase your risk of infection and everything else. There's some questions about follow-up. So um, after the one-year follow-up, uh, most institutions, you don't need to uh, follow up uh, with the uh, pulmonologist or interventional pulmonologist that placed your valves, but you would continue to follow with your regular pulmonologist. I'm getting a question about um, if how many if both lungs get a valve and, and how many lobes get a valve. To answer that question, we target only one lung. So either the right or the left. Within the right or the left, we target only one room or lobe. Um, and we target the room that is most damaged and is not really helping you with your breathing much. And we target a room that doesn't have any open windows. So, so that's what the testing does. It helps us determine that. Sometimes there's more than one target. Um, there could be two rooms that are not really doing much. And we pick the room that is the least um, useful in your lungs. Um, and if for some reason that room doesn't, well, by collapsing that room, it doesn't work, you're still feeling short of breath, we could move the valves to a different room or a different lobe to help that. So to answer the questions, we use, we always do one lung. We don't do two lungs, just one lung, right or left. And within that lung, we could do more one lobe and we can move to another lobe if that one doesn't help you. What, if, what is the pre-Zephyr valve screening test? We touched about this during the lecture. The biggest thing is your breathing test will let you know if you're a good candidate. After the breathing test, there are certain tests to look at your heart, to look at your carbon dioxide levels, to look at your, your lungs, to see if there's any collateral ventilation. So I would start out by your breathing test. That would be the first step you wanna take to determine if you're a good candidate. Some suggest to leave the valves in, uh, the valves in even if no with if there is no collapse. Um, it, this is this is a this is a tough question. Um, the purpose of the valves is to help you breathe better. By putting the valves in, we look whether it's working by doing another breathing test and then comparing your breathing test before the valves went in to the breathing test after the valves went in. That can tell us if it's working. Number two, we look at your CAT scan again, and we look at your CAT scan before the valves went in and the CAT scan after the valves. With, those, with that information, we can tell if the valves are causing collapse of that part of the lung that we don't want. Um, if we don't see anything there, but you're still feeling better, better, that might suggest that on the microscopic level, on a point where we can't really see those numbers, it is working. And we as an institution at Henry Ford tend to leave valves in if it's working for you without showing signs that there is collapse. However, if you start developing complications like frequent pneumonias and so forth, we do recommend taking the valves out or doing a revision. Initially, we would recommend doing a revision before completely removing the valves. It is on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so it could be different at different institutions. Um, let's see. There are a lot of questions about COVID. Um, it's a good question. And since COVID is, has been around for a while, I'd like to address that. Um, vaccination status does not preclude you from getting the valves or not. Um, it, vaccination status is entirely up to each institution and, and their own. At Henry Ford, I can tell you that vaccination status does if you are or are not vaccinated, it does not make a difference for us. We're not here to judge, we're here to help you. Um, I can't speak for other institutions. Um, if you recently had COVID and you're still recovering, COVID can take a toll on your body as a whole. We like to wait a few months and see how much recovery you gain because we wanna make sure that what you lost wasn't from just the COVID itself, but, but your lungs themselves. Um, is there a contact we can cut 
um, yes, uh, it, again, for contact information, uh, you can visit uspatients.palmonics.com. That's US patients with an S at the end, palmonics.palmonics.polmonx.com. And we'll put that in the chat as well for you guys to, to go to if you need to. Um, Another good question is who performs the necessary testing, um, you or my doctor? Um, you know, and that varies, again, between treating centers at Henry Ford. Um, we, you know, patients can get their PFTs and certain testing locally and get it faxed to us for review. And, um, you know, in the case of Guy, I think he did all of his testing locally since he lives about 12 hours from us. Um, and the only time he had to come was to clinic for his visit and his CAT scan. And so um, most institutions, I think, accept testing um, from your local pulmonologist so you don't have to drive. But um, those patients who can't get testing done locally, you know, our coordinator, Jill, she uh, coordinates all your appointments on the same day. So if you needed uh, pulmonary tests and a six minute walk and an echocardiogram, you would get it all that day that you came to see me in clinic. So again, it varies. So I would reach out to whatever institution that you're going to be Seeking adults from. And I, and I want to make it clear, uh, Jill is the coordinator for the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Um, a lot of you are from different states, uh, and I do advise you to call your local pulmonologist to, to determine whether or not they do the valves, and if they don't, if they could refer you to someone who does the valves to get the testing done. Um, I'm getting a question about why do we need an echocardiogram. Um, the lungs and the heart work together to help you breathe. Um, as the air gets into your blood through your lungs, the heart pumps it to the rest of the body. So we perform an echocardiogram to make sure that the heart is okay. And we also do an echocardiogram to check the blood pressure in your lungs. If the blood pressure in your lungs are very high, that could explain why you're short of breath. And we recommend getting that assessed rather than having valves put in. That's called pulmonary hypertension. Do valves remove CO2? No, the valves have no effect on your carbon dioxide levels. Um, will diabetes complicate getting this procedure? No, diabetes does not complicate getting this procedure. Um, is an overweight person a good candidate? We, we would like your BMI, your body mass index, to be below 35. However, we have made some exceptions with certain individuals. Um, so I do ask you to um, check in with your, with your pulmonologist. Um, if you're having negative results and the valves need to be removed, does your lung re-expand? Yes, they do. If, if the valves Great are question. removed pretty early on, they re-expand. If the valves have been there for years and the lung is not, uh, is still collapsed, sometimes they could scar over and they won't re-expand, but we take away the risk associated with the valves. Um, so to answer your question, yes. 99% of the time your lung will re-expand. There's a lot of questions about lung nodules and um, I'd like to kind of tackle that one. There's many of our patients, I would say over 50% of them have lung nodules. I mean, I may have a lung nodule right now and nodules can be, um, you know, simply inflammation. It can be, you know, uh, infection like bronchitis um, and it can just be, nothing but there's those nodules that keep growing and growing that it's concerning that may turn into cancer um, when it, in a patient that has a smoking history and so do not nodules exclude you from the procedure no but we'd like that nodule to be nice and stable or getting smaller or going away um, before placing those valves so we have had patients that we put on hold for six months or so while we repeat their CAT scans to make sure that those nodules aren't getting bigger. And again, it's for safety reasons. Um, but no, that does not automatically um, uh, exclude you from valves. But I want to thank everybody uh, for joining the call today. Uh, there's plenty of resources on that website online to answer more of your questions. And a big thank you to Dr. Cohen, Rebecca, and Jill. Uh, and also, uh, Hi, let's not forget uh, Guy. Um, mm -hmm. So happy to see you doing so well, what, two and a half years after receiving those valves and, and taking the time to uh, join us and share your perspective as well. So 
Thank you everybody very much and have a great rest of your evening.